Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the organizers. Uh, I'm hoping we can make this sort of interesting for you for the next sort of 30 minutes. And what we've done is give me a practical um, a case study where we've been working this area. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give an explanation in that uh, these kind of things don't come about because someone's thought about it in a factory or a situation, but it is a whole philosophy we're taking forward. I just want to give sort of, I go to the next, I just take the next slide of it. I just want to give an, an understanding of where we're coming from, because then you'll understand the journey we're taking. And the journey we're really going on, if you can just look at that triangle there, that triangle is what we call our creating shared value. And Neste's approach to sustainability and environment is really quite simple and straightforward. And what it says is that we'll make money, because that's what we're, doing, we're an organization to make profit, but we'll also give back to society. So the two things are quite clear that we will do the two things. And the creating shared value triangle, if anyone's read by Michael Porter's uh, creating shared value, that's where it comes from. And the base of the triangle is the first rule is we'll meet compliance at all levels. It doesn't matter where you are, which country you work in, compliance is number one. And you will also, and if the compliance doesn't meet the necessary standards, uh, you will have to go beyond compliance to meet the necessary standards in whichever model you want. The compliance is key. There's no, there's no sort of sitting back and saying, oh, we'll do something magical here. Unless you've got compliance in, uh, you do not move forward. The next level is sustainability. And sustainability encompasses everything we're doing. And I'll give you an example of how we look at it. Uh, and the sort of holistic approach we take to it. And the final, the top of the pyramid, is the three areas where we focus in. Uh, in terms of, uh, we're a nutritional company, and that's what we focus in. We focus on nutrition, we focus on water and rural development. So these are three key areas for our business. Uh, if we don't have those three things, you don't get your kit. If we don't have those three things, you don't get your coffee. So all around the world, we recognize those are three focus areas we need to always concentrate on. But that's equally to say, uh, you can't, you know, before you start really digging into those areas, you need all the other baselines there. Uh, everything I'm talking about, you can find in our CSB brochure in the UK. We just released our latest one out, which will be in the next few weeks, which will be the results of 2011. So if you Google, let's say CSV 2011, we'll get our latest results. So, in the UK, what is it we're doing? Um, about three, four years ago, we decided that it, it's great talking about these things. And as Mario Andretti once said, if you're in control of a Formula One car, then you're not going fast enough. And that's how we felt, that you know, there was some kind of control, but that just meant we were standing still weren't really going far enough. So what we've done, we said, right, what is it we're really trying to do? What is our vision? Where do we want to end up with? And we came up with a concept called the Fordham Lighthouse. Fordham is a factory in Newcastle we have. And we decided that we needed to focus on sort of six areas there. There was energy, weight, water, biodiversity, value chain, community, and people. And basically, you've got this sort of practical side, but without community and people, you don't get sustainability. So, and that, that was a fundamental sort of thing. So we've set our target for 2015 to achieve a lot of things, and we just stretched the targets again. But what I'm trying to get there is that it is a holistic approach to all of this. You, you can't do things in isolation. So when Ryan comes up and talks to you about how we go about our energy work, it is in the context of this. And when we look at uh, the energy, we also do the same for water, we do the same for waste, and we do the same for biodiversity. And last week I was at a site at uh, one of our major coffee plants we just donated, <coughs> we just created huge meadows. Because we know that without nature, once again, we don't exist. So it is to understand the whole concept, just to, you know, just not focusing on one area. And from all of this, what you do get is a lot of employee engagement and you do get community development. So what Ryan is going to do is talk through to you a, a real case 
know how we go around looking at energy and what we do in energy reduction. But I wanted to give the context that it's just not a one-off. But it is a journey where we'll get better and better. And it is about pace and scale. And in Newcastle, where we're trying all this out, it is the blueprint where we will roll this out fairly fast to all our factors. Good afternoon. Uh, so building on, on what Andrew was just talking about, I'm going to specifically focus on Nestle UK energy and water management strategy. That's a quite a complex slide on what I've just Just to reiterate here, this is very simply energy costs are uh, one of the biggest drivers coming from Nestle around the energy we deal with one. I don't really have an engineer in the room. Okay. Um, between now and 2020, we, we, we're, we're projecting 20 million increase in our uh, between 20 and 30 million increase in our energy bill. And obviously, the environmental targets they're coming from our CSV report, up uh, to 40 percent carbon reduction by 2020. So this is the business case. Moving forward, then for the new reality, we're going to see a new energy strategy. Uh, quite a complicated map. I'm not going to focus on the whole of the management system, but more. My mic working? No. I'll stop moving around it. So the, uh, we'll be focusing on the metering element, the energy mapping, and the energy audit. These are the three first milestones of the UK energy management system. So first we need senior management commitment. The starting point here is, I'll just talk about ETS. So ETS within Nestle's energy target setting. Um, it's a concept whereby we bring a team of energy consultants into the business for about two weeks to undertake a full factor of energy audit. But before, before rolling this process out, we need to engage with the factor technical teams across the UK and get them to commit to, uh, to putting the dates in the calendars for these studies. So in the UK, we've committed to more than seven studies this year, um, and we've also supported four across Europe between now and now. Uh, last December. Okay, it's a huge commitment for the factory, generally costs about 1% of the factory energy bill, so anywhere from 3,000 up to 30 or 40,000 pounds per study. Okay, to do this though, we needed the people within the factories to be able to coordinate these events. So back end of last year, a business case was presented that showed where the business costs were going with energy and how putting for sustainability engineers in Rome and each of the 14 faulty manufacturing sites across the UK will be able to deliver a return investment uh, of months rather than years. It's worth it now. Right, so this is this is the ETS concept. Um, generally you can see here it's a 10 day study, but in advance of this study we're preparing the factory between two and three months in advance in terms of data gathering. So the idea is we've got a team of between 20 and 30 people who are specialisms in energy, water, refrigeration, heating and ventilation, air conditioning, steam. Generally made up of specialists from work within Nestle across the 14 sites from industrial services managers and automation engineers. But also we've, we've focused on bringing in Called business partners such as Barrack, uh, Nalco, Schneider, and taking taking these people into these teams, using the same people for each study, so we're building their competence in this process and rolling our own. And eventually, we've got a core team now that we roll out across all of these 14 sites. The idea is by by day five, we've identified a provisional list of projects. We normally target between 30 and 40 projects for the first week. We identified each of those projects, the CO2 saving, energy, cost, water. And we, we, we plot these projects on a chart and start looking at return on investment. Well then within the second week we focus into these projects, the projects which can be built up to greater projects, projects which really don't deliver a quick enough return on investment. With the idea of Coming up with about 27 projects, this seems to be the magical number 
for every city we do, we find about 27 good projects. Um, and they're not ideas. Every project presented it has a value. It has a summary, a one-page summary. And behind every project is sufficient data and facts with it to be able to submit that forward for capital investment. Um, cool. Okay, the preparation. So if the study in itself is great, if the factory's not ready, then we just won't deliver the results. We've seen we've seen these studies in other factories in Europe where we've put the results in place but we've failed to deliver the expected results. So we've got the right people without the preparation. This is a, an example of, of how we've standardized the way in which we meet a, a energy across our factories in the UK. It's a hierarchical process which reflects the existing management systems of the factories. So we will stick at these minimum levels we want to get to before we roll an ETS program into a factory. We can see here we're metering at the factory level. We're then looking at the industry, what we call the industrial services DOR. So this, the DOR is a daily operational review. So every day within these factories we're challenging the efficiency of all our conversion processes. Refrigeration, steam, compressed air. This is where the efficiency is challenged, not the consumption. Then we look, make sure we've got metering at department level. This is about consumption now by department. So as in this example, it could be department with a, an aero plant, a Kit Kat plant, and a polo plant. So this is really giving accountability to the area managers. So they know that we're almost at a point now where we can give them the energy bill for that department. Again, taking away any conversion losses which are run by the industrial services team. The next step, we're not quite at this level, the tertiary level. Um, to get to this level involves huge additional cost. Well, we haven't got guidance on this now for Nestle in the UK, and we're specifically looking at big energy users now at this level, rather than just marketing this level of nature. We've got to be very cautious when we created this approach we realized that in the past we've installed metering without really understanding the objective. We've installed metering to gather data without having a customer who wants that data. So the idea is you build this around the existing management system. And finally, from these daily operation reviews we can feed data into the weekly and monthly operation reviews. Okay, so as part of the process through ETS, we have Sent out six core teams: so thermal, electrical, refrigeration, process, our plant specialists, and water team. Within there, we can see observers. So this is a global strategy ETS. Um, but within the and within the UK, we'll be wearing this in January. Um, what we do is we bring in observers. Either those observers can be from business partners trying to build their competence. So we we would push the business partners to put these guys in place free of charge allow them to learn from the process. Then we could have people from other markets, from Germany, Spain, France, they could be coming across to share this process. It really is a, a big learning exercise as well as that value to the factory. The key here is understanding that it's the one result that we're expecting. So we not we wouldn't say I want five teams from each five projects from each team. We're looking at the, the best result for the factory from a team working as one regardless of whether they're a business partner or an SA employee. So the process starts by trying to visualize how energy is being used. So on the basis that we've got in place the right level of metering already and the right people using the data, we can quickly do a visualization or an energy map of the factory. This is our smallest factory, or one of the smallest factories in the UK on the left there. This is a girly factory, just producing dairy, uh, dairy products for the Kit Kat. Um, and this is a diagram of the electricity that's being used for the factory. The idea is very quickly, within the first few days of the process, we map the energy across site, target where we're going to be um, focusing the team's efforts. So success at the end of the, the, the two-week exercise will be making sure We've got projects tackling all of these big energy users. As well, once we calculate, we calculate the energy of these streams further in the process, we can start looking at uh, stream coupling and energy recovery. What's important 
important for, for, for Nestle to reduce, reuse, recycle model as we talked about frequently. But when we're looking at energy saving projects, it's quick to jump to new technology, to deep recovery. But what we need to challenge is holistically how the assets being operated. It may well be that this is an example of an evaporator. These losses here are all from design. These losses here are from operation. So when we're looking at businesses to make, to make good returns on investment, where we automatically step towards capex. But in reality, when we've got good levels of metering and understanding of how our assets operate, we may find that there's still big easy wins to be made around how we're operating, whether it's out of temperature, out of pressure, idle mode, shutdown, changeover. Uh, this approach, to be honest, this slide doesn't do this justice. This is a whole three-hour presentation in itself, how we're approaching these assets. Um, but for us, this is certainly the future for Nestle. So this is zero loss, it's zero loss in capital. So and again, to reiterate, before we look at recovery, we look to optimize. Okay. So the integration. Once, we, once we've challenged how much energy or water we're actually using on the process, we can start to map the energy streams. So these are basically hot or cold streams that we continue them. So any product that needs heating, anything that needs cooling, we map the temperatures, we map the enthalpy, and we start looking at process integration. This is a real example from one of our factories. This is an example from the Halifax confectionery factory in a quality street there, hopefully brand new all familiar. Um, here we, we looked at a pinch analysis at distributed services level, where we actually rejected heat from the refrigeration plant at a higher condensing temperature, so we produced 60 degrees C hot water. We then offset all the thermal load in the factory currently produced from steam, couple the two together, so now all the chocolate in the factory is being heated from the energy that we're taking out of the chocolate at the end of the process. So we're closing the loop. But again, most of that loss is from jacket and pipe work. But in terms of the reduced model, we shouldn't step quickly to looking at that as a heat sink, somewhere we can put waste heat. We should say to ourselves, yeah, what should we be using to heat the process? Is it properly jacketed? And then, using the true future heat value, you then size the future project. So you're future-proofing these solutions as well. This is a huge benefit of the EGF program. We have, we have fantastic resources in the factory, people with brilliant ideas, but they tend to be working on, on one project, on one asset, on one great idea, without understanding the, the total impact of this across the site level. So when you've got ETS, at the end of the, at the, end of the process, You've got 30 projects you can look at. You look at the impacts of both energy, water, and CO2 on those projects. And you can choose, you can be selective about how you approach the investment, looking at the bigger picture. So when you're looking at heat recovery, you may, you may be guided towards an easy option, an easy win that's local to, to the asset or operation you're looking at, without really looking beyond that factor, looking at the whole site and finding Big, big, bigger opportunities. Again, this is this is the Halifax model, and here we show here we had distributed steam users all over the factory, a scattered distribution system of steam, and the end solution of this factory was nearly an 80 percent reduction in steam use, uh, and a total reduction of energy more than 40 percent, largely driven by compliance, driven by a need to change the boiler house. To, to move away from R22 refrigeration to a natural refrigerant, which is the UK Nestle policy. So we managed to get a three year return on investment on a, on a significant amount of capital. So the results. For each ETS study, we aim to target between 25 and 30 projects. We propose from that three to five year investment plan. Now, this we do accept five year return investment for sustainability. We would like them to be less than a year, like every other business in this room, I'm sure. Um, 
where ETS accepts these extended paybacks, mainly because we're also looking at water, and we understand that within the UK, for many of our factories, water has a, a real value and very little. And in fact, the only return on investment normally is generated from the energy content of that water, or the waste value of that water. So we aggregate the total benefits of each project into a waterfall chart. So this is the reason why we call it ETS. So energy target setting is on that chart, we show the baseline of the factory. We then show the delivered benefits from a three-year investment and less, a three-year plus, and a five-year. So we both with most of the projects being in, the, in less than three. But it really does keep the factory manager now a, a future investment plan to deliver, on average, 20% energy reduction. In Gerland, the first ETS uh, we held this year in Scotland, we found an 84% reduction in water. The biggest yet, an ETS record world with an estimate. And uh, in Spain last week, we delivered a, a 63% water reduction on a factory that uses 5.3 million meters cubed a year. Just to put that in scale, that's 25 percent that Nestle use in the whole of the UK. So it's, uh, the process is it's quite amazing, quite amazing uh, result. And both on CO2 as well on cost. On average, we're finding a 20 percent reduction in the energy bill. And for our factories, you know, where, where we've got five, up to five million pound energy cost per year, these are significant. <coughs> And cost of conversion for some of the factories, like the coffee factories, can be as high as 20 percent. So these are, these are great things for the factory manager. Okay, and for each study, um, standard report. So when we do an ETS in the UK, or we do an ETS in Chechen Sao or Poland, they all look the same. We've created a standardised approach. Um, these, these, these reports are shared at a national level with all the factories and globally we're building now a central resource. You, you can appreciate we've got 20 projects there. So we should be looking at these projects and yeah. trying to share these before the ETS programs come to the next factory. So we need a really easy wins. Uh, so so trying to try to create a sharing community using all the outputs of these studies globally is something I'm currently, currently working on as well. That's it, but it's, it's often just the start. We've got the energy manager in place. We've got a standardized way of, of, of mapping and metering energy across site. We've just given that, that the energy manager nearly 30 projects to work on. But we, need to, we still need the investment. The investment isn't secured. It's still for the factory to, to challenge that their investment should be ahead of their neighboring factory. So there's still some influencing to do there. Uh, but to understand that this is only the start. Because this is not sustainable. This is just a list of projects. What we have to do then is back, we will skip back to the, the mapping chart, is to really challenge how we're using energy and water in a daily, weekly, monthly operational review structure. So challenge on a daily basis what our operators are going to do differently to reduce energy the following day. Are you able to benchmark the factory against each other and show how they're one to improve those functions? Yeah, we take the benchmark by what's called SPU, so we benchmark confectory factories, yeah. and we normally do that normalized against volume. So energy per ton of confectionary factory, for example, is about 3 kg per ton. A coffee factory is about 90 kg per ton. So it's very different technologies, so we do that by, by range. But also with the zero loss approach, what we're able, we're able to do now is benchmark technologies. So benchmark and evaporator, benchmark and cooker, uh, and molding plants, and refrigeration systems. So, and also benchmarking efficiency. So we, we're saying now a refrigeration plant should have CO2 higher than 5, or a cooling tower, type of concentration more than 50. And we, we should have benchmark uh, the industrial service assets as well.
it, it, it's, well, it comes from Europe, largely based on a European standard, um, and often it's much higher than, than some of the developing world. But in, in the UK, some of the UK standards are actually could, could be higher. So it's, it is, it's, like, it's general, like, generally based on the standards across Europe. Where we often more strict than any local policy, <laughs> because compliance is so important to the business. Right, once you decide, once you've collected data, how do you decide what targets to set? I mean, to what extent is this a collaborative approach with sort of local managers or to what extent has to be a corporate um, energy target? Energy target. Energy target. So the, the energy energy targets are largely issued at European level. So we have a European 3% absolute energy reduction year on year within Nestle. But we also have to look at our external carbon reduction targets. So really, in the UK, our energy reduction targets are being designed to complement the carbon reduction clearly. Thank you. 